？没有哦，有，还没开始呢。So, hey everyone. Uh, we I see we have a Lena and a Kenneth. Uh, from the last uh, course, I think we have some new guys joining today, but uh, I'm not sure they when they are going to come. I'm just waiting for a while, and Lily, and yeah, I don't know. <laughs> If there's a new guys coming in. So let's just start it and see if the other guys come in. So starting from this week, uh, we are going to start a, a new course. Actually, it's the extension of the, the Python introduction. Now we are stepping into step into a new area called the, the machine learning and art, artificial intelligence course. It's one of the one of the advanced course of the Python introduction. The other one is going to be what's going to be the the contest. But uh, yeah, we decided to go go through this one because I think the uh, the school decide this one is more potentials. So yeah. 
so machine learning and artificial intelligence. That's uh, the one of the reasons that uh, we have learned the Python before is, is exactly that uh, it's the language that uh, the de facto, the ad hoc de facto language that used uh, in, in machine learning and, uh, and AI in, in, in the industry. There's a lot, a lot of like uh, libraries and uh, frameworks because it was used uh, for, for scientific computing and uh, machine learning is actually a, a subset of scientific computing. So it can leverage a lot of these libraries and uh, build a fancy framework like uh, TensorFlow and things like that, and Keras ca ca and things like that, and uh, they can use the they are used everywhere pretty much now in Google or even in in, in Netflix. And oh, we have new guys joining. Like Matt, oh. yeah, faces, yeah, face recognition. That why I would mention that. Uh, and is that uh, face recognition is one of the, the very popular application of, of machine learning. So which which library are you using? Yeah, it's quite, pretty cool. Which li well, I, I remember that you have some experience. You have some experience with Java, right? Are you using Java or are you using Python here? Okay, you use Java. So which library you use for for learning? Reproduce that face recognition of thing. Yeah, here when in this course we'll mainly learn from the start base. Okay, it's platform. So you use a library that your friend made. That's cool. And uh, in this in this course, not really. You use a uh, which which thing you using? Actually, in this course, we are gonna. Which library you use uh, for 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 this doing this machine learning task? The first, you need to take pictures, right? F take pictures, but the pictures you can take from cell phone and uh, pretty much anywhere, or even from the camera, the digital camera, or up download it online. The celebrity faces, I guess it's online, yeah. Single shot detector. Okay, then probably probably it's more of a, a computer vision library. One of them, yeah. It's not a, a generic machine learning library, something like that. Yeah, here in this course, we are gonna uh, we are gonna learn some of the the basic the underlying mechanism of how these uh, machine learning like the machine learning uh, libraries works. Not only this, uh, if you want in this course, you can also do a project. Yeah, the colors, faces, and uh, different. It's more of, uh, yeah, more of the combination of the, you, you, what you are doing is more of the combination of uh, image processing and uh, after the processing phase, you, you plug in a machine learning component to probably to recognize that. Yeah, and in our, in, in this course, we're gonna introduce some we're going to introduce some more more fancy models. Like uh, one of them is very useful for for image segmentation and the recognition. That's uh, that's called a, a it's a neural network. It's convolution 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 neural network CNN. That's it's the that the, so far has the best performance for for image recognition. That's even used in in self driving cars now. So. In, in this course, we're going to learn a lot of the, the core models and the things like that. And uh, but we we are going to we are not going to focus on the on the theoretic part because you guys are still young and uh, uh, maybe it's too hard for you to to learn the theoretic part. Just to introduce you so how to use the library, how to how to do the fitting, train a model, and. Uh, Getting some, getting some model out and uh, use that model to to see how that model works and uh, get some hands-on experience on those things. So what the first is let's start uh, on very basic stuff. What's the concepts about what's machine learning and AI? The machine learning AI. 
let's start with AI. AI is more more general than machine learning because it's it's not just a to to give you the definition is it's to understand the intelligence of of human being. That's that's scientists, AI scientists does is to understand things because science is about the about find out how things work. So that's how, that's how find out how human human being intelligence works. But the, what we focus, we are engineers. So, and what engineer and in the industry folks um, in focus is engineering wise, it's to create uh, some mechanism to mimic human intelligence. So, but the, that's based on the scientific research. So if you you don't have if you don't have those scientific research in universities and uh, for, for, from the professors or or from scientists in the inside the big companies, uh, you don't have that uh, the knowledge to do the to build those designs to mimic uh, human intelligence. But the, in that there's a lot of things people do. Like uh, in the in the early days, they do rule based uh, system. Like uh, if the condition is like that, then I do that I do something if the condition is something else I do something else that uh, that one actually works in some cases if you have very specific domain knowledge like uh, if you go to a doctor or even if you go to a pharmacy and they will ask you a list of questions that uh, if you 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 have you have some some problem before if you have some uh, you have allergy al al allergies or if you you have fever or if you you are feeling pain somewhere on in the in the body, and according to those questions, then they can just from a, according to a, a list of rules, they can decide which which prescription or which drug to give you to give to you, and uh, from doctor or pharmacist. So that's called a rule based system, and some computer system built to to work like that. So. That's one of the things, but uh, these days, um, most of this, uh, these systems are very limited in, in in the in the things they can do. It's quite uh, quite limited actually. So these days, it, for example, it cannot uh, cannot recognize image that you cannot def explicitly define a, a set of rules to to recognize what is what is an apple or or what's the face or what what what's the face of a certain person would look like. That's 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 very limited for for the rule based system. So that's where the machine learning component comes in. So machine learning is very useful to to learn a, a set of rules. That uh, to say, for example, to recognize the voice of somebody, to recognize the face of somebody, and that that's why it's also sometimes called a pattern recognition. So it's much uh, so if when when you see pattern recognition, it's almost the same thing as machine learning so and uh, as i as you guys know that uh, there's the, the machine learning start uh becomes popular because of the alpha go and alpha go is something that uh, is a program that uh, can do can do the go game and uh, what it does so is by is to recognize to machine learning to recognize the the distribution on the on the go board on the goal of the, the board of the goal and uh, give it some some kind of uh, criteria or some of the evaluation some score for each board situation and uh, it, uh, decide which next step to to put your put your uh, put your uh, put your uh, which step in which in the next step will you you're gonna do and uh, leading you to a better better board situation so that's that's also kind of pattern recognition to recognize the board as well. So also there are some some guys are doing doing automatically playing video games even. That's also a recognition that the combined how how you how you recognize what's on the screen or and analyze the situation and uh, issue uh, behave like a human and issue different uh, commands to the game to 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 guide you to to a better situation in the game. That's also machine learning. So what machine learning is calculate the, the result on both input and historical data. So you first you need to learn that set of rules, and then you use those rules and uh, give it a certain input and give you the output. 
So that's what machine learning is. Machine learning is one component of AI, and uh, that's very, and the, now in today, it's the key part of AI, I would say. It's uh, very popular because of, um, AI today is popular just because of, because of this machine learning part. AI was there like, uh, already there like 60 years already. It never took off. It's just because this machine learning part to give it a boost. Like in, especially the, the deep neural network, like 10 years ago or, or eight years ago. And then the alpha goes, goes popular. So that becomes very popular. And uh, also because the image recognition and the voice recognition requirement is, is everywhere nowadays because we, everyone has, has cell phone and uh, the, our cars become more and more smarter. And people, people are requiring more, more natural, like a human computer interface. They wanted to talk to their computer. They want a computer to, to recognize things in, in real world. That's why yeah, uh, machine learning becomes so popular these days. So. Yeah. What's the applications? Uh, like I could just uh, talk about it, there's AlphaGo. That's when when machine learning really took off in in the popular culture in in the industry actually, and then all those kind of uh, AI companies merge emerged, especially in in here in in where I am in Montreal, there's a lot of the, the like AI startups growing growing up there mainly because the, the professor. Um, Professor and there is a professor in in University of Montreal that very has very like a high <clears throat> very high reputation in, in machine learning and AI. Ben Zhou, if you you guys are interested in that, in, you can you can apply for University of Montreal. But yeah, that's why it's like that. And there's there's the face recognition as the as Kenneth just said, he's doing face recognition for, for celebrities. And uh, that's, that's one of, also one of the very important, very popular applications of, of machine learning and AI. And even nowadays, like, uh, that face recognition thing is everywhere. It's because you, you have that, uh, the cell phone, and uh, you, you in from, I, uh, from iPhone and uh, some Android, you can even do like a face lock. That one you can it can learn your face and then later you can use your face to to unlock your phone something like that that's also an application of machine learning face lock something like that yeah and also in Facebook you 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 guys probably also know that the, the Facebook can know different people's face so that real real becomes a real the Facebook the name becomes a really a Facebook so. Really, they can recognize faces nowadays. That's also because the machine learning algorithm used it there. And also the voice recognition part. And now, nowadays, those if you ever use GPS, or I don't know if you guys are old enough to drive, but the, once you drive, you, you need a GPS in your car, and most of those GPS are, are, voice, uh, are using voice command because it's very dangerous to, to touch your your GPS during driving. So it's much, much safer to use voice command. And those voice commands inside those GPS machines are, are, use, are using machine learning algorithms to do to recognize your, your voice. So that's also one thing. And also those, those small things in your, in your cell phone as well as like Siri and the OK Google, Alexa, something like that. Those the Google Home, all these kind of stuff. These kind, these stuff are more not that serious, but the, the GPS is really serious. So also, there are another another kind of uh, category of problems that machine learning resolve uh, address. That is the the recommendation system. Have you ever because nowadays there are more and more content uh, in in internet that you can browse or or view. And especially in in those video video websites like YouTube, like uh, Netflix, that uh, whenever you want to choose something to watch, 
um, they 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 do some recommendation. They, they do some kind of recommendations, like. Uh, but then in order to 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 attract your click, they 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 try to figure out which which one is the best, uh, like which one is the most likelihood that you you most likely you are gonna click on, and that involves some machine learning algorithm as well. It's based on your past. Uh, you pass the uh, watch log, you pass the history, the watch history, and uh, you can calculate and based on based on the your friends watch history and based on whatever you uh, the, the the some some other people that's very similar to you has watched and they recommend some those guys watched but you haven't watched to you. That's basically how it works. But there's some algorithm that can be that are used to determine that. It's called the uh, uh, collaborative filtering. So we will talk about it later in this course. If you ever see those, uh, if you ever see the, the, the content of the course, when I also mentioned there, the collaborative filtering, kind of matrix refactorization and the collaborative filtering. So basically, let's start the, the, what's the machine and then now we know what's the application of the machine learning and now we see what's the the progress of uh, uh, the crook uh, that yeah well, what's the process of a machine learning uh, problem actually so this is a this is not the machine learning problem this is just a generic problem if you you take a generic computation problem you have some input for example, the face faces, you have some faces, and then you do some computation based on those faces, do some pre-processing and things like that. And you want to say, what the, what's the name of those faces? That's the output. So basically, that's a basic computation. Any computation problem looks like this. It has input, has output, do some computation on that. But the, if it's just like that, we, we don't call it machine learning. It's just a just a generic algorithm. But the, the more more generic, more more like more if you I add you yeah, sorry. If I add uh, some training data and uh, I use those training data to calibrate the computation, to calibrate the rules that you, you decide. Then that's called that becomes that that problem becomes a machine learning problem because you have input, you have output, and you have historic data, you have training data, and you use those data to train your model. Also called it, to train those computation, and then the computation itself becomes a model in terms of machine learning terms that the training data the tra trained into the models, and you use that model to do prediction. So this whole this the, the top pipeline becomes a prediction and those the, the lower one the calibrate one it becomes the training one so machine learning any on machine learning has two parts one is train and one is predict and the train you do at the you can you do there are two uh, also many kind of training like online training offline training you train with live data things like that but those are also fancy things but the the uh, the basic is you you need to train your model before you use it and uh, once you once you have your model you can use your model to predict something so that's the two part of machine learning problem now some of the myths and truths about machine learning and ai in comp in enterprises some problem okay myths and truths so and of course, you. I, I. I. think you guys already heard many, many things about machine learning. It's a. It's good job and things like that. But the, what uh, as as I, I. I work in this industry and uh, yes, I. I work in with some people and uh, I myself do some machine learning as well. So, these um, as an insider, I can provide some some. Some uh, dismiss uh, like like uh, say that uh, 
some some of the impression of machine learning of uh, inside the industry is not uh, true for 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 someone outside the industry. It's not uh, like a rocket science or or black magic things like that. Although sometimes you you do need a PhD somewhere, but the, most of the guys don't need that. We, as I said, the first myth is that you have a very smart guy that uh, develop an algorithm and uh, like a uh, you do everything, uh, you write the algorithm, you train the data, and uh, bang, it, uh, it solves a very, very hard problem, and it works very well. No, it not works like that. It's, it's most, almost everywhere you, you, you got a team to do that. So you, you need the, the actual modeling of the thing, and the, the training uh, the model and the configuring the model is not that big. It's mostly the getting the data and the, how to how to improve the quality of your data and uh, pick the right model is important, it's, but it's not uh, as important as many people would uh, would imagine. So pick a model and train the model and compare different models and deploy it and make sure it deploy works and uh, figure out how how those deploy. Uh, and there's another, there's some when many like engineering goes into other parts of the of the whole pipeline of the thing. So the, the teamwork is really important here. It's not the, not just a one person thing. Yeah. And and you everyone has a has some contribution to to this to to the whole project. It's not the not one PhD that says do everything. So and though the myth too is that the machine learning can solve everything your company has that the and once you have it, you 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 don't have any problem anymore. No, it's not like that. Uh, before the machine learning, different companies have to do different things, has their own way to solve problem already. But uh, maybe machine learning will add some add some improvement to that. It's just uh, yeah, it's uh, like a like a computer vision. Before the before the AlphaGo goes popular. They, they already have some algorithm to to solve it. Maybe it's not the machine learning algorithm, but the, it's still useful to to recognize. For example, for for OCR for optical uh, character recognition, it's it's working already quite well without machine learning algorithms. You you have a picture of of something. You have a picture of the uh, of text, for example, an article or something like a table, or something like that. A picture of that. And you can recognize it very well already. And machine learning just uh, make it one step further. For example, now you with machine learning, you can even uh, you can even recognize handwritten handwritten letters very well. So that's another. So that's an improvement to the problem. It's not uh, not something that uh, that uh, you becomes uh, that solve a problem that uh, that we ne we can never solve. That's just a marginal improvement to existing technology. No, the the number three myth. Number three myth is more more insider kind of thing, but the, to the to the to the new beginners, they they learn a lot of different mathematics models. They learn like deep neural work, the new neural convolutional and convolutional uh, neural networks, those very complex models, the SVN. But the the thing is that uh, and they 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 might think that the the complex model the better. Because it's complex, right? It can do everything, but the, it can fit in your data really well. Yeah, that's true. The 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 complex model you you can you can train in your data and like uh, you after you train your data you can you can re for example if you have the training data and you use a very complex model you can get 100% correct uh, for for the training data, but uh, it 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 has tendency of overfitting. So if you it's a very complex model, and uh, it it mine it uh, usually doesn't work well on off sample data. You don't you don't have like uh, if you use it on something some some data that uh, that's not in training data, it's probably not working so well against. Uh, but uh, uh, not working so well comparing to to the simple models. Like uh, so so the. The, the experience here is to to start with the simplest most model possible. Of course, you need to you need to have some domain knowledge to 
to, to understand what the, the what the simplest model can be in this case. For example, if you want to recognize the face recognition, then a linear model is definitely not good enough here. You 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 definitely need more more powerful models here. But if you are just a say like prediction predicting some like two variables, for example, if you want to predicting um, something like a uh, predicting the the area of the given the area of the of some the of some uh, real estate and you want to predict its price so that's that's a, that's quite straightforward thing actually so if you you have uh, that one you you might even get get well with a linear model like ax plus b something like that you can you can you can do pretty well with with very simplest model and only add complexity when when the model is not enough well, it's not good enough and the, with complex model there's another problem is because the behavior is is, is so strange it's not predictable sometimes it's, it's too complex it's not predictable and a small a very small change in the input can can have like very bad output and can cause the the, the output to, to 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 be very different than the it's a, it has a very different uh, it can be behaving very differently versus if you have a linear model very simple model like a linear model a little bit of change in the input it just change a little bit in output that's very that's working very well so if you even if your input is not accurate enough that's often the case for example if you you have a picture that's not the not the condition is not very well that's uh, very like a blurred images things like that or your you know, your measurement of some some input, for example, the area of some real estate is not accurate. The output is just going to have a little bit difference than the, the ideal value versus the value you get. But the but in in some complex model, it might not be like that. You like that you you off a little bit on the input and you screw that in the output. So yeah, that's that's the thing. You learn this the, the choose the simplest model possible. And uh, the number four myth um, is that uh, because you I don't know if you guys have ever heard of those those uh, frameworks like uh, uh, Spark, like uh, like the Hadoop, or or even like uh, the TPU, those TPU special hardware hardware with TPUs, a thousand TPUs that can doing machine learning and a specific design to do machine learning but the, these things these machines are actually very rarely rarely used uh, in in real life maybe there's some company like google they they have that need but uh, in, uh, in almost like 99 percent of the other companies you don't really need that uh, that hard the data process the clusters do need it, but it's not used uh, for for training. It's uh, for pre-processing. Most of the hard lifting is for pre-processing. Once you convert everything into well-defined numbers, it's very uh, you don't need a lot of resource to to train the model, train your model. The training of your model is not that bad, actually. The back testing is bad. Back testing. If you have you you usually select some some training data, but you you leave out some leave out a lot of the testing data and you you, you want to go through all the testing and that's going to consume a lot but uh, that as well does not uh, you just need clusters sometimes but the the training itself does don't need uh, like a cluster like special hardware and like gpu tpu things like that you can pretty much done on a single ordinary machine if your data set is not large Usually, you don't need a too large data set to to train a model. If you need that much, your 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 model is probably too complex. So that's a little bit about uh, about the truth and the myth in in AI and machine learning enterprises. So so I see that there are some prerequisites for this course. This is not a, a, a fundamental elementary, uh, like the entry level course. It uh, has some prerequisites, but uh, I see there we have we have three guys already done the first course, so they um, you guys don't have any problem. And the math, I think you you passed the 
passed the exam, so it shouldn't be a problem for you as well. So the prerequisite come. There are two parts of prerequisites. The math part. I think if you you take uh, your, you guys have. Uh, uh, I don't know which how old uh, you guys are, but uh, if you guys have already take like a ninth degree or something like that, and uh, I'm not a graduate here. Sorry, I don't know what the what the what the pro. Uh, uh, with the project progress of the of you you guys that in, in studying math in math in school, but I think it, you guys should already have that uh, covered. So the math for the math part, uh, I don't need a lot. It's just uh, the first thing you need to know how to solve equations. So that's that's one thing. And the second thing is you need to know functions like mathematical functions like sine, cos, cosine. It's just know what a function is, how to what the, the image, uh, the plotting of a function, and uh, a qu what what's a qu quadratic function, what what the what does the line looks like, uh, what the ax equal ax plus b equal y equals ax plus b, uh, what's the image of that function, uh, y uh, y equals x squared, what's the image of that function, and some things like that. You guys need to know. Because we are going to plot a lot in this course, but then that's about it. And uh, for the for those missing part, I will cover in the next a few lessons. So for for matrix linear algebra basics, and uh, also for some of the calculus, I I need to cover a little bit. But it would be nice if you guys all already know it. But if you don't know the don't know the linear algebra and the calculus part, it it's fine. That one I will co cover that. There's these two things I will cover. So the basic Python as we covered in the last course that's already done. It's data types and the control square structures and the function. That's all we need. We don't need like a object object programming like those classes and objects. We don't need that. But they are also um, but nonetheless, it's it's good to know uh, it's good to know that such things exist and uh, know some of the interfaces. So now let's set up our environment. Like in the last course, we all, all we use the idle all the time. That's not the what we use what we use in real life. So that's for the introduction course. Now we we need to install something to use in real life. So what, what do you do we use in real life? Like Anaconda? That's one of the things that so scientists use. So you guys need to go to this this URL to download this thing. This Anaconda. This is the this library this is actually a distribution anaconda is a is the is a collection of software that they used for for uh, data science and also computer scientific computation so go to this website so we're going to go to this website and uh, Select your uh, operating system. If you are on Windows, you, you download Windows. If you are on Mac, you download on Mac. So select the Python 3.7 version. Python 3.7 version. And you after you download that, you should get uh, Get an installer, and uh, you need to install that thing. And can you do, did you install it? You have it already installed, right? Then 
if you have used it. But make sure you are using the Python 3.7, at least Python 3 version, not the Python 2. Yeah, yeah Python 3.7 version. Yeah, then you need to do it now with other guys. If you're stuck somewhere, please let me know. And if you are done, I think if you, you can see this installed in your Windows or in your Mac, I think it's somewhere else, then also let me know you're done. From Mac, you should uh, select, you should see it in your launch pad. And from Windows, you should see it in start menu. Okay, good, good job. Yeah, so you let me know if you guys have done it. Then we will start the, the notebook. We will mainly use the, the Jupyter notebook inside this anaconda. What? Why it's taking so long? Okay, your Wi-Fi is slow. Maybe you can move your your move closer to your router. Oh. Then you need to choose a different ISP.
Uh, maybe maybe there's someone some someone else in your house are using it. Oh, that that's that's real bad. Oh, that's real bad. It's forty seven minutes. So in this case, you don't need to install VS Code. You don't need to install that. You just type everything in, in the notebook.
in the meantime, I can show you some of the, the functionalities in, in Jupyter. This is the this is the main tool that you guys will use in this course. And actually this is the main tool you guys if you want later in all of the data science and machine learning industry jobs. And this is the library, NumPy is the library that we'll talk about later. But for now, let's just go over some of the, the Python basics to make sure that you guys are refreshed. The function definition, for example, you can define any function here. If it's x squared, like if you want to evaluate it, just to run this cells and you can press shift and uh, shift plus enter to go into the next cell to run the current cell and go to the next cell so run this cell and go to the next cell and now you can do something like this and if you press control and enter it's run the current cell so each this rectangle here is a cell it's called a cell in, in jupyter notebook so this is these are three cells here the first cell second cell and the third cell and if you inside the cell and you press and control and enter that's that's run the current cell and the output is the, the last if last the uh, last thing that you put in this cell which is f2 which is 2.2 is 4 here and you can use shift and enter to go to last go to next one for cells you can delete them actually you don't delete cells and you can delete it actually i don't want to delete it this is the one I want to read. Yeah. Are you guys, uh, where are you guys now? They finished downloading to you guys or? Did you did you any of guys start installing it? Okay, so almost there. Maybe let's just take, take the, move the break here now and we'll come back. Like everyone take a break, 10 minutes 
So I'll come back at uh, at eight oh four.
So we are back. Sure. Well, you guys finished the install. I see Alina, you finished the install, right? So how about other guys? Okay. So you guys, you guys all get this uh, Anaconda Navigator, right? Hey, Lily, let's just wait a little bit for Lily. Actually, you can just click this stupid notebook, but uh, anyway, I'm starting it directly from here. So, but you guys need to start at one of these. Jupyter, Jupyter notebook. If you have a command that you don't remember, you can you can click this this keyboard thing or the command palette and the type in whatever command you want you do. Like move move cell down, move cell up, Something like this. Delete delete cells. It's a pretty much very powerful search engine. Actually, this thing can can show many other things other than just the numbers and or or Python objects. Can show a table, for example. Lily, you also got it. And uh, Kenneth, are you still stuck in your Wi Fi? How many minutes do you have left? The main page of Jupyter, are you mean here or this files? Yeah. And you can create new one, new notebook, Python 3. Then you can get into it. Actually, there's some, I don't know if there's some documentation for it. Jupyter notebook. The notebook dashboard. And actually, if you have folders, you can go into folders and uh, create uh, create notebooks there from there. It doesn't document it very well, or there are too many documentations. Just so for those of you already installed it, you can start the notebook. Notebook. Present. Make it larger. There are two ways, actually three ways. 
from Anaconda, you go to the Anaconda Navigator and uh, the Jupyter Notebook, install and launch. And from the prompt, if you guys prefer that the command line, you can open the prompt and type Jupyter dash notebook and press enter. That's how I started here. The thing, Jupyter dash notebook. So is everyone opening the notebook already? You guys should see something, some screen like this when once you open a notebook in your browser. You you might not have those files. The files might be different, but uh, you should see see the similar screen here. Lily, are you opening the notebook now? Okay, I don't know. Where is Ken? Matt, you are on the home page. What do you mean? Is it uh, this page or is somewhere else? The, the Anaconda Navigator, you're in the... If you're in Anaconda Navigator, you need to click uh, click the Jupyter, Jupyter, Jupyter Notebook. You should see this Jupyter Notebook somewhere in the in the home page. Okay, in the Jupyter home. Is it this page? This one. Okay, the home. Okay, yes, then then let's go with so you guys can create a new Python 3 notebook somewhere. Or create a folder and create a Python 3 new notebook inside of it. You can create a folder and you can rename the folder for example, and inside the folder you create a create a notebook, and then after you create it, you can rename it. Then you can do the same thing as I do here. Get yourself a little bit familiar with the thing with what's available in the menu, menu, what's available in the toolbar. Uh, open which again? Open the home page or open the, the notebook? You open the, which page are you on now? The one, this one, the new, new, new file. If you want to open another one, if you just want to close it, just close that uh, tab. If you want to open another one, yeah, you open new file should be here. Then you can rename the file or just leave the title, and you can go through all these menus and you can use up a little bit familiar with the thing. The main thing that we will use is save for, for sure. And uh, add a new role. Each cell here, that's the kind of cell actually should uh, not roll. Each cell, each cell here is a, a small pieces of Python code. You can type any Python code here. But you need to run it. After it's run, you have a number here. So in means input, and if you have something, some value, 
then in the out in the output means output you have some value being shown like this is number it's actually integer in python and this is the string in python a dictionary in python list so these things after you type one like i said you can use shift plus enter it's a it's a shortcut to go to the next one and run the current one and go to the next one and if you have you, you press control plus enter mm. the numbers are not set automatically it's set automatically once you run it if you if you type something in it and if you if you run it by click click run then the number will will showing if it's kind of finished installing it oh So we can move on. I can send you the video of this lesson if you can. You want to try everything. So to create a new Python three notebook. Okay, and that's good. You can even skip a, a part of this lesson as well. Like each cell, the, the a notebook is consists of many cells. So each cell, like I said, it's a small piece of Python code, but it can be something else. It's called a markdown. The so markdown is a is a language, but it's it's not a programming language. It's our markup language, like markup markdown. That's a it's just a joke for it's the name of it. A joke. It's a markup up language called Markdown, and uh, it's very simple to use. It's mostly you programmers use it to document their code, and uh, in notebook they borrow it to to write documentation. So we'll cover that in next next few slides. The one thing is getting help in in notebook in, for Python is very easy. Remember that in idle we we have the help function and we need to type out help and the open parenthesis and the, the the function or the class name and the close parenthesis. Here it's very it's much easier here in in notebook. You just need to type the question mark. Let's go back to to one of the notebook here. You want question mark. Have something you want to know, a function that you don't know you want to know, and evaluate. You see that it should should show up, show a different uh, pane, in different panel here. In the bottom, that uh, show the documentation about this this thing. For example, I'm showing a sum here. The sum function is taking an iterable and a and then return the, the the sum of those iterable. If you're passing an empty iterable, it, the, the default value is zero. So, so actually the start value is zero. And it high, even highlights some of the things. It's very nice. So that's how you get help and P. For example, here a longer one. You you if you you guys don't need to read a trick is you guys don't need don't want to read all of them, just to read this line to figure out what it does. And look at the parameter that you want passing, and don't ignore all those that you don't want to pass in and. Uh, with a default parameter. 
So this called the default parameter if I if I haven't mentioned it before. Means that if you call the function, this NPI array is a function. If you call the function, and if you don't pass in those those parameters, it's fine. You just need to pass in the first one, and those not pass in, you will you will get these values automatically. And if you want to pass it in, you can you can use this called a key val uh, keyword parameter. The type is, for example, flow sixty four. See it this. If you remove the D type, it will be none. None means it will figure it out, figure it out by itself. So it will be an array of of integer instead of the float. So that's how to read and the output is something something the return value the each parameter. Usually you have the documentation for each parameter and the return value and then something related to it. And some examples you can look at. These are the things. So let's first uh, get started with with something new. That's Markdown. So Markdown is is a very simple language, uh, a markup language called Mark, Markdown, that used to create the format text content. It usually in notebook it's used to explain your results. You can also use the take notes, use it, use the notebook like a real notebook. That uh, depends on how fast you can type. You can also use latex. Latex is another thing that uh, used to mostly used to to type set to type your paper. That if you want to publish a paper in the back in the old days, uh, like everyone almost everyone used latex. Nowadays some some people use. It's a micro Microsoft Word or something like that, but it's not as powerful as LaTeX because if you have a Word document, if you ever have a Word document like a hundred page, then it, it becomes very painful to maintain. Versus in LaTeX, it's very easy to maintain because everything is is explicit using command to set up, and you can set up one page versus one a hundred using one command to to change the say change the font. Of some things that some specific part part of the uh, of your paper using one command things like that versus you have to go through in Word you probably need to go through every page to change one thing. But the, in 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 Jupyter Notebook the LaTeX is limited to to write the mathematic formulas because LaTeX is very very easy. It's the it's the one of the most popular thing to to format to 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 write out the mathematic formula. And uh, this the math the LaTeX need to need to surrounded by dollar sign, the single dollar sign or double dollar sign. A single dollar sign usually means it it's in line in line math formula, and the double dollar sign is a is a special is a paragraph of of the mathematic formula, and we will all, and we will explain that later. Let's first get start with Markdown. So Markdown crash course. So what Markdown provide to us? Okay. Let's first just get a. Okay, close these. Uh, Break something that should be fine. Let's first uh, get something. Yeah. For example, here I want to, to to create some markdown cell. Once you create a cell here, you change the type here from code to markdown. Then you 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 have markdown. You can type anything. 
here. And if you reevaluate, it becomes something like this, like text. You can explain explain the, the code you have right. The above code uh, print out uh, table, something like that. And that's, if you type just like that, it's just a uh, render as a normal text. And if you want to start a new new paragraph, you you put a empty line between it. This is the second paragraph. So it looks like this. Normal text looks like this. But Markdown is more than that. You can have headers. So a header in Markdown is prefixed with this. As a hash. If you start a new line with hash. And the title of this notebook. Then it will automatically, this line will automatically become the title and become the header. And it will become larger than, and even put a link above it. So you can put, you can link to it, send it to someone else and uh, have, a, have it automatically jump to that uh, chapter. That's the title, and the title can have different levels. If you put more hash sign, it will give you different title. Press heading two. If you put more and more hash, it will become smaller and smaller. And if you run this cell, remember that it's control plus enter. You will see that you know, at head four is almost the same as same size of the plain text of the normal text. So instead of writing now, instead of writing your your paper in in Word, Microsoft Word, you can write your paper in Markdown. In my opinion, it's much better. You don't need to to like uh, select uh, these and uh, to change the font. Something like this. you just need to type out everything. We have header five. I don't know how, how much we can go. Okay. Things are not. Let's see. The six, six is the most you can do. So, heading five, heading six, almost the same there. But yeah, usually you, you don't need that much. And that's headers in Markdown. And also do to emphasis and strong emphasis strike through. Those three things are are applied on some words in the in the in the normal text. Emphasis means you put the, you can put star and the star between inside of the between two stars. You can put a word. It can contain space, but it must be in the same line. And if you run it. It will emphasis your text. In this case, emphasis is just to make it uh, slide a little bit, slide a little bit. I think it's italic. But, uh, not sure it's just slightly or italic. And if you wanted more emphasis, strong emphasis is two star between two stars. It becomes strong emphasis. It's bolded. So, and you can strike through it. I don't remember a lot, but uh, is it this? Uh, I, I forgot how to strike through it. So in order to get help, there's markdown help. If you click into help and there's markdown and you can give you, in, give you a web page that you can see basic writing and formatting syntax, the styling text, and the strike through. Okay, it's two, two tiles. So. You can strike through some text to show it's, it's deleted. So that's on the on some 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 normal text. 
to add uh, and emphasis and something like that. And then also you can have list list of things. List have two types of uh, list. If you ever learned the HTML or web page, there are two types of list. One is order it that you have a number before it. You always have number before it. The first price. Second price. And the third price. You see it to automatically convert it for you. Slide and uh, indent it a little bit. And then what's what they're doing more magically is you can you can always use one here. You don't need to to um, to put the real number here. You always use one, so that if you want to add something like this in the middle, it's possible. And the all the all the following numbers are automatically increased. So you can always insert something, and don't you don't need to go and change everything follows it. So that's you know, you always use one or you can always use zero actually that's what we are going to do but uh, in this case if you're starting with zero starting with something it will starting at that point if you're starting with four the next one will be five and the next one next one will be six seven five seven six eight something like that and the first one is the one that you want to start with, and all the following one you can fill it with zero. And the second uh, kind of list is an 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 ordered list, an ordered list. This one, so you just use a star before it. So a list uh, an ordered list of something of fruits. You're being contained it together. Okay. Now you see that you just use a bullet point to separate to mark it as a, an an ordered list. List. And you can have links. If you put something like a URL, like HTTP colon slash slash www google.com if you put it it automatically becomes a link but if you want to give it a name you can hide it a little bit using square bracket putting a name and put the parentheses behind it and put the url inside this link it will become this and if you value it becomes a google that uh, Link it to you some somewhere else. Become you can become the hyperlink on that link on that text. So you can like this. So that's the link. And also you can show code. It's not super useful in in this here because usually you want to code in in its own cell. It's also possible to to write markdown inside not write 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 code literally inside markdown. So how to do that is using a triple triple back quote. So if you guys cannot find it, it's on the top left uh, corner of your keyboard. If you like triple triple, and inside of it you can write code. Inside of this, you can write code. The code basically looks the same as this thing, but uh, it doesn't have highlighting. It just use a different font to to show it. Uh, it's a code. Maybe some some of the thing can yeah, it can highlight it. 
if you put the language, what language it belongs. For example, here we have Python code. We have a triple, triple back quote and Python code, then you can show it. And it has Python highlight. It's almost the same as this one. And if you have JavaScript code, you can also show it here. Yeah, it becomes this JavaScript code because this is Python code. And uh, I don't know how many languages support, but there's a lot. So that we can do in, in Markdown. And the latex part. LakeFix actually inside in, in it's used inside of the markdown cell. And uh, it's mostly, it's almost being exclusively used for mathematical formulas. So in markdown cells, you can, when, whenever you put the dollar sign, something between a dollar sign, between a pair of dollar signs, it becomes converted, being converted to mathematical formulas. And the single one means it's in mind, it's, it's mixed with with the text surrounding it. And uh, the double dollar sign, it's a block mode. So it uh, will, will have its own paragraph, have its own in its own line. So let, let's just uh, try something out. Let's remove all this. We can type it like this. Note that here, the small x, I surrounded with two dollar sign. So when I evaluate that we run the cell, it becomes a mathematical symbol. Like the x is different than the, say the x outside of the, outside the math one. It's a little bit different. It's more fancier, right? You, you can see it. And if I put the put the double double dollar sign, then it becomes a mathematical formula that has that's on its own line. So it becomes like this. And some of the some of the latex special characters, you can see it. It's, we have a lot of Greek Greek letters in in math. You guys already know alpha. So backslash alpha is alpha, beta, and uh, gamma, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, until, you, until theta. I think theta is it, yeah. So you can, you can also, these are all lower, lowercase Greek letters. There's also uppercase Greek, and the Greek letters, just up, uppercase this thing. Not all of them have uppercase corresponding uppercase because alpha is the uppercase of alpha is just A, right? So the beta is just B. So these two don't have the gamma has the uppercase. Uh, so the gamma has uppercase. If you guys want to see it more closely, yeah, you do this. It's more easier to see. Yeah, we can send send out videos, but uh, we are not going to send out the, the the slides and the, the notebook. These things that we need to take yourself. So. You can you can watch the video and take notes. So 
but don't be too worried about that. And these are the Greek letters. And also you have subscript, superscript, and subscript. The superscript is use a hat to represent the hat. X hat to is both basically X square. I will show it later. A underscore one is A with a subscript one. So if we see it. X hat two, and you can see that uh, it's x squared. And if you have underscores, you can see it's put it and uh, put it in the, as a subscript subscript. can see that uh, the underscore one. The sigma, the sum of i from one to n of xi, the sum of xy for i equal one to n. So that's how we represent that in, in latex, I mean a markdown cell in, in Jupyter. So the underscore represent, whenever you see that underscore, it puts something lower and the sum as well we see that sigma the sigma has something below it and something above it so when you see that the it's an underscore and it's a curly bracket curly bracket in 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 latex basically just group things together so when you see underscore and curly bracket something then you put those things under the under the sum and you when you see hat you put the whatever after it above something. So it becomes this. So that's underscore and uh, up and uh, and the superscript and the subscript. And also fraction. So as you guys all might know that, that as we we go into the further into the advanced math course, we, we no longer use the divine sign. We always use the fraction. So nobody uses that divine design anymore. So we use fraction. It's called a frac. For example, A over B. It's like this. So it's frac, something, and something else. The numerator and the denominator. So that's frac. And also, once the matrix, one the one of the most important thing in this course, matrix. You guys don't need to know what it is, what it is, but uh, basically you just need to know it. It's a list of numbers, a list, a two-dimensional list of numbers. So, you print out the list. You have different flavors here, but uh, usually I would use the B matrix, which it means. If the bracket is, it's the it's a square bracket it's called the B matrix. If you use, there are also a, a, a different style called the P matrix. P matrix is, it could is this parenthesis, put the matrix uh, between the parenthesis. So I prefer B matrix here. It's more, more tiny in my view, but uh, more 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 tidy in my view. But uh, yeah, so you can use your your own or whatever your teacher says or your prof says. And inside the matrix, you need to begin the matrix and end the matrix, and between them, you put uh, each value. And in one row, you have three rows here matrix and each row is end with backslash backslash two backslash basically two backslash in latex means you start a new line it's a it's end of this line and uh, type next type type the things next on the next new line but just change line change line and change line and uh, end end means you need to align it 
So if you have a, a number that's very long here, it will align properly. It won't uh, like push everything into the list. It will align properly. So you need to use end to separate those numbers inside matrix. And use this to separate line. Use backslash and backslash to separate line. So that's how you represent a matrix. So now you've learned these, you can pretty much write your own uh, math paper in, in, in notebook and uh, mark down. That's much, much easier than in, than in Word, in my opinion. So let's get into the real meat, the real meat, NumPy. Yeah. That's the first thing that we are gonna, the first the real thing we're gonna learn in this course, course NumPy. That's almost everywhere you will see it in, in numeric computing and in, in machine learning algorithms written in Python. And even if you don't see it, like TensorFlow, if you don't see it, if you don't see it, but uh, it's under the hood, it's, Oh, I didn't install it yet. Yeah. Even you don't see it, but the, under this TF, it's like every function in MP is almost supported to this guy. So maybe in a different implementation, make it faster. But uh, if you, you want to do machine learning in Python, you, you must uh, master this library, the MP. So that's one thing. NumPy, that's why we teach it here. What's NumPy first? So it's a library. The core of the NumPy is a, a multi-dimensional array object. So it's called the ND array. So it's n-dimensional array called. So it's a multi-dimensional array. Usually you you only uh, in life, you only see that one dimensional array or two or three at most. But uh, in, in machine learning, you have very high dimensional data sometimes. But usually you have very high dimensional data, like 10 is, is, is quite low dimension. It's hundreds of dimension as normal. So it's so the multi-dimensional array is, is a must in, in, in machine learning. And the, by the way, if you, if you, I, I, just said TensorFlow, right? Do you know what tensor is? Tensor basically means multi-dimensional array. So it's just a just a physicist. How physicists call call multi-dimensional array? It's called a tensor. So more general than a vector, right? An array of component that uh, create coordinate space. The so tensor basically means a multi-dimensional array in physics. So even TensorFlow is just a fancy name for for multi-dimensional array. It's multi-dimensional array flow. So there have many derived objects as well. But so we'll we'll go through them go through them later. And also we have the data structure. We we also have the routines to to do operations on them. And uh, doing it fast, that's the point, because it's even you don't do like uh, millions of operations. Millions is not that bad, actually. Even you don't do billions of operations, mm -hmm. but uh, doing it in Python is quite slow if you, if you write everything in Python. So many of the operations are, are written in C, actually, in C or C++, and uh, it provides a Python interface to, to be used easily in Python. So that's a very nice example of how, how, you, how you write the underlying implementation in, in a faster language and uh, provide some interface in a slower language, but the nicer language, like uh, Python. So, so let's start with the, the most basic thing, the ND array. So ND array, as I said, is n-dimensional array. It's a it's a short name for n-dimensional array, but it's it's a real thing in, in Python. Later, I can show you that 
it's actually a class name in Python. And we can convert to, well, how do we obtain an ND array? The first thing, the first way we can go, we can do it is a Python list, it actually can be converted to ND array very easily. So basic, but basically it's one dimensional. If it's a one dimensional array, remember that in Python we use a square bracket to, to represent a Python list. And uh, to convert to array, we use this function called uh, array. And MP is usually a, MP is the module name. So usually people, people import NumPy as MP and uh, just do save two, three characters. So that you just need to, you only need to type out two characters. Let's just try it here. You guys can try it on your own machine as well. So, so this array is actually ND array. If you see the type of it, so the type is NumPy ND array. So if I, as I said, if you see the documentation, so you can see it's a multi-dimensional homogeneous array of fixed sized items, blah, 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 blah. If you have, you can read through these documentation, for example, in the arrays documentation after, after this course, I'm not going to go through all of them now, but it's good to, to, to read them and uh, know what it provides, what the what the what the characteristic of those of those data structures. So that's one thing we can convert a Python list into an ND array, and uh, not just the one dimension. We can put a higher dimensional Python list into ND array as well. For example, here, here this thing is a two-dimensional Python array. You see that it's, it's at, the, at the outmost it's one list, and the, each element in that list is another is a separate list. So you basically have a two-dimensional array with three by three. And if you try it here. Just copy paste. You see that the it's printed out, and they, it even aligned for you, pretty much pretty sweetie. At the eight one, the first row is eight one six, and the second row is three five seven, and the third row is four nine two. That's very nice printed out as a two-dimensional array. And actually, it's just uh, this matrix. This thing and this thing is actually the same thing. This is what you would represent this matrix in NumPy. So apart from from getting it from a Python array, a Python list, there are other ways to getting an empire array. Mostly it's, it's, you need to get a very special array. For example, the MP zeros give you a array of zeros, all of zeros. MP zeros takes what? Takes the shape. What's the shape of this thing? Shape is the, is the tuple. Basically, shape is a tuple that it needs to tuple, and each each element in the tuple is the length of the dimension on, on that in that uh, array. So here, I create a two by two array. 
which is a two-dimensional array. And uh, we fill it with all zeros. So there's one shortcut. I remember that uh, if you just pass it a number, it will just do just give you a array of that one dimensional array with with all zeros in that thing. But you, as long as, as soon as you want to hit two dimensional array, you need to pass in a tuple, which is the shape of the thing. So here is a 10 by 10 matrix with all zero. So don't forget the, the, the extra parentheses. If you miss it, you will get an error. Look at this thing, data type and not understood, which is not very helpful. So, so better remember that. And whenever you see these kind of errors, use this to read the documentation and find out uh, what 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 you are doing wrong here. That's the right way to do it. In zeros, you also have some ones. You can, it's uh, almost the same as zeros, but uh, you, it, it filled the array with, with one instead of zero. That's the only difference. And it also can take a shape, 10 by 10, all of one. And this this one is a, a little bit more special than than zeros and ones actually. So the I I means I actually only takes one. I only returns matrix actually, and the only re re returns square matrix, which means the number of rows is the same of number of columns. Number of the columns is the same of the number of rows. So it takes only one number. It returns a square matrix. And uh, that square matrix is it's diagonal or filled with one and everywhere else filled with zero. So that's an I. And that's actually what I will talk about in in next slide in, in a few slides. In the in the linear algebra, this is the, the identity matrix, and it used I to represent it. We usually use I to represent that. That's why it's called I. The n is the size of the matrix. In this case, it's 10. So that's identity matrix I. And uh, that says in a diagonal, it's all one, and uh, everywhere else, it's zero. And the A range. So if you remember that uh, there is a range function in Python, for example, range 10 is, is range 10. If I convert it to list, range 10 is 0 to 9. And uh, NumPy has a similar thing called A range, which is array range, but it, it gives you the gives you the array direct, directly. If you do this, it just gives you this 0 to 9, exactly the same thing. And if you remember, you can pass a start value, and you can pass a step. The all, all work the same as Python range, except it returns an empire array. So there's one last thing that I want to special mention is the line space. The range is useful, but the, the line space is useful in another sense. Range is useful to, to know the, the start and the end value and the step. But uh, sometimes you want uh, the line space, you want uh, a specific number of points that uh, evenly distributed in, 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 an, in, a, in an area, in an, in an interval. So that's very useful in to, to plotting, plotting mathematical functions. 
say I have a sine function and I want to draw, I want to calculate that the value of the sine x on 100 points between zero and one, and then I can use those points to, to plot out the, the graph of that function. So that's, that's the use case for, for the scene. So this basically means I want value from zero to one, include the zero and one, and I want a hundred value between them. And uh, it will give you this thing. So you will get these hundred values. If you check the length of it, you'll get a hundred value. And then they are distributed evenly. So use this one. You can take. You can use this one to pass it into, say, the sign, and get out another another list, another num and the array. So any function that that uh, comes with NP can take the and the array and return and the array. So if you pass in and the array, it will give you and the array with with in with the first. Uh, First uh, element in the array is the is the value for taking uh, the first input in the array, and the second one is the second one in output, the second uh, one in input, sign of second one in input, and the third one is third one in input, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's very useful to use these so that these are the y values and uh, these are the x values. If I if I write it out here, x is this. And the y is np sine x. Then you have x and y. Then later, x and y. Then later, we can use these two, two things to, to plotting a function, plotting out the functions. That's the basic idea how you would uh, plotting functions in, in Jupyter or in NumPy, because NumPy can be used everywhere, not only in Jupyter. Yeah, next one. Okay, I see there's not a lot left for this lesson. We are out of time now. So if you guys so if you guys have any questions. Yeah, otherwise we'll see you guys next week. I guess this week we don't have assignment. It's too little to be taught now. Next week we'll go go continue on NumPy and we will go over some of the go over some of the linear algebra and the calculus as well. If I we are fast enough. Otherwise we'll get it step by step. Yeah. Okay, so if you guys don't have any questions. And see you guys next week.